Hello, makers of meaning. Every day we rise up, put on our superhero capes and go to school to work with the children. Our lessons are planned, our weekly plans are drawn up and our work schedules are up to date. We know what we are doing. Often, we even love what we're doing. But do we remember why we're doing it? Do you remember what drove you to want to be a teacher more than anything else in the world? In the days when we had face-to-face -face lectures, I used to ask my first-year students this question. Many of them would smile with delight and tell me how much they loved children. Then I would open the door and tell them, run! Because one doesn't become a teacher because one loves children. Children can be miniature psychopaths, as anyone with one year of experience will know. If one is looking for a job to satisfy the love of children, choose to be an au pair. Another reason used to be that prospective teachers really wanted to make a difference. Better. But make what difference? And to whom? And when? And after one has made that difference, what then? What do we really mean when we say that we want to make a difference? Research around this question reveals that there are extrinsic reasons, those that are on the outside of our heads, like the suggestions from parents and family members, career guidance counsellors, or fairly good salaries, and the recognition of society. Intrinsic reasons, or the ones that are inside our heads, show an enjoyment of working with young people and a willingness to contribute to the greater good of society. Woodcock and Hakim suggest that we should co-create responsible partners in social living. But what does that really mean? None of these reasons are really enough to keep us in the classroom when the going gets tough. And we all know how tough that going can get. So why do we really teach? Don't you think it's because there's a place within every teacher that finds meaning, that understands the incredible promise and the terrible threat of the future? Don't you think it's because we want to be architects of hope? Because in the simple space of our classrooms, we and our learners can become powerful agents of a different tomorrow. We just have to work together to make that possibility become a reality. We cannot predict the future. That fact has hit home very hard with the changes that the pandemic has brought into our lives. Two short years ago, who would ever have believed that the entire world would be shut down? It was the stuff of science fiction films. This 21st century world with its fourth industrial revolution brings a strange newness. South Africa has recently been awarded the first ever patent for a design created by artificial intelligence. Elon Musk would like to make a massive nuclear explosion on Mars to make artificial suns to create an Earth-like atmosphere. These are realities and not the plots for futuristic novels. It is in this world that our work must be done. It is here that we should attempt to co-create responsible partners in social living so that whatever the future, our young ones are able to face it and move into it with courage and capacity. Our work is strongly influenced by our contexts, our schools and our learners. These techno-savvy young people of today are a very different kind of learner from even one generation ago. They've been exposed to so much more than we can believe through their life experiences, their screen cyberspaces, and through their interactions in the fourth industrial revolution. Even the most removed and the most socially disadvantaged children have felt the effects of this time in one way or another. Knowing them, Knowing their lives and circumstances and working within that knowledge is an important part of our work. Parker Palmer suggests that good teachers join self and subject and students 
in the very fabric of life. Just think about that for a moment. The joining of self and subject and students in the very fabric of life. That is such a rich and deeply meaningful description of our work. If we are aware of our identities as teachers and intentionally grow our inner selves, and if we have rich content knowledge that enables us to teach with fluidity and purpose, then in order to fulfill the real meaning of our work, we have to know our learners. We can no longer rely on generic descriptions of learners in the 21st century. We have to look into the very faces of those whom we teach and know them. It is only then that we can begin the task of being the architects of their hope and the co-builders of their futures. Boichner suggests that our work is the place where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meets. This is a beautiful description of teaching. But we first have to know the essence of our gladness and the essence of that hunger. Once we have answered those questions for ourselves, and they can only be answered by ourselves, then even on the way home, on a bleak, rainy day, with a pile of books to be marked under each arm, even that becomes an act of meaning and purpose. Because each act is an offering to the world's hunger, given with meaning from our sense of gladness. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you again.